Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers Podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers Podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. So, cool. All right, we're up. All right, so we're, we're, <laughs> Kai, welcome. Uh, and like I said, I, I know you're not going to be able to top this story just because I'm in here wearing my Apex Predator t-shirt. I just got back from the gym. I'm out there training. And so I do something really dangerous. I had to go. And so I'm in Southern California. I'm in like vegan central, right? And I'm in, and my girlfriend, who's pretty much carnivore, about 95%, but she, she still eats like some, you know, yogurt and stuff like that. She wanted some lactose-free yogurt. The only place that had it near me is Whole Foods. Oh, now, no. <laughs> Whole Foods is like vegan central, man. And so I'm walking through. I had to, I had to get through the produce section. And I came out, you know, I came out with the yogurt, but I came out with some pork belly, which I had some brisket as well. So <laughs> I risked life and limb to get here. Now, Kai, I know you've got nothing that would top that as regard to getting food. I mean, this is, <laughs> being through Whole Foods with vegans is, is dangerous for a guy like me. So anyway, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the, welcome to the podcast. Um, you know, you're down in Australia or New Zealand or Australia. I can't remember. Australia. Yep. Australia. You're not those dirty damn Kiwis that, that uh, you know, those guys, right? You guys are mortal enemies or sort of more or less. Well, apparently we are, but I think it's a bit like the Canadian sort of U.S. thing. You know, the U.S. is sort of oblivious to it and the Canadians hate being called Americans. I think yeah. that's the sort of Australia, New Zealand thing. Like yeah. we don't really mind, but if you call a New Zealander an Australian, you're in trouble. So yeah, you hear stuff about underhanded bowling, you know, with cricket matches and stuff like that. I mean, I remember when I lived down, when I lived in New Zealand, I was playing down there and Zach's heading down to Kiwi land in a couple of weeks. Um, I got to get down to Australia. I've never been. So hopefully I'll make it down there uh, in the next year or two. It'll be real fun. I mean, give it a bit of a time to recover from these wildfires. But yeah, going down. It's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Well, Kai, tell us, is that how you say it? Is it Kai? Is that how you say yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what that means in, in Maori, right? Um, yeah, ocean, but it's spelled like K-A-I, I think. I think oh, no, that's Hawaiian. Said, no, I think Kai and Maori means food. Does it? I believe so. I, I believe so. And I, if you have any, any Maoris in the, in the comments section want to con- correct me, but I believe Kai was food. Oh, anyway, that's it's boomerang in, a, in one dialect of um, Indigenous Australians. So you've got boomerang, you've got ocean, you've got food. I'm like, I've got everything covered. All right. Well, I'll tell you, that's been a long winded introduction. Will you please tell us a little? Can I, I, I mean, I saw your story like a year ago and I was like, wow, she'd be cool to get into the podcast. And then it just got you know, things get crazy. And I, I, I kind of saw you again. I was like, Hey, let's see if you come on. So thank you for coming on. Tell us a little bit about your story and then we can get into whatever questions kind of evolve from that, please. Um, I was an outdoor guide uh, for five years after breaking my back in a car accident. And then I decided to sort of go as extreme as I could. Doctors diagnosed the car accident saying I would never be physically active again. Um, and so I went straight into rock climbing because that's sort of what I think of when I think of rehab and something like that. <laughs> and then um, was in the stunt industry for 16 years. Um, it ended up tearing my hamstring completely off. Um, it might not surprise you guys to hear that I was vegetarian for 20 of those years. Um, diagnosed by doctors when I was about 20 for hemochromatosis. So their recommendation was either to give blood for three times a week or just go vegetarian. So that was the basis of my vegetarianism. Um, Yeah, 16 years in stunts, tore my hamstring completely off, was trying to rehab from that, no success. And then someone suggested, had seen an article sort of saying that the carnivore diet could um, actually reverse hemochromatosis. And I was really sort of getting in bad shape. I was tired all the time. I wasn't feeling healthy. So I decided to give that a go. and sort of seemed to completely reverse the diagnosis of hemochromatosis. And I've never been healthier, never been fitter, never been stronger at 46. Um, I do extreme survival. So a lot of 
um, the challenges I set myself are going out for long periods of time. We're just taking a knife out into the outdoors. Um, and I, as soon as I decided to not be vegetarian, I decided to hunt my own food. So the weapon that appealed the most to me was the traditional bow and arrow. So that's sort of how I try and source most of my meat is through, through hunting now. So you use like a recurve ball then or? Um, I do. Yeah. I have a, a bear super grizzly, which I love <laughs> and, um, yeah, just go out mainly goats. They're, um, you know, feral animals in Australia are a huge problem for farmers. So I'm going out and helping them and I'm also sourcing some really good meat. So that there's a lot of stuff in that little intro. Right? <laughs> <laughs> some of that stuff. So first of all, I mean, congratulations for surviving and doing all that stuff as a vegetarian. I mean, it's like, it's literally like, you know, giving yourself a handicap and then doing this stuff. So I applaud any of these vegan vegetarians that, that, that manage to do things that are tough because you're, you're literally handicapping yourself. And I'm, you know, you know, I mean, it's kind of a backhanded compliment and I kind of mean it that way, quite honestly, yeah. but at the end of the day, you know, you find out what happens when you go from this and you're really, you, you know, you do reasonable well, but then you, then you kind of see things, but really the, the hemochromatosis thing is fascinating because, um, you know, what you're looking at behind me is a big juicy steak and it's got a lot of iron in it. It's got a ton of iron. And so there's mm -hmm. people that are really concerned about, oh, we're going to get all this heme iron and for, and particularly as a carnivore diet, cause you're eating god knows how much more iron than the average person would take in and so the thought would be we must be accumulating iron you've already got this genetic predisposition predisposition to store iron and were you at one point donating blood and doing all that stuff did you ever come to that i never did but i would regularly go even as a vegetarian i'd go really orange um like especially up around the eyes and the hands it was so obvious um you know, on set once, a, a makeup lady gave me a hard time. She's like, you know, no one wears yellow eyeshadow anymore. And I'm like, no, nah, that's just this, my eyes. <laughs> that's the way they go. Um, and my bloods, like, so I don't know a lot of the science around this stuff, you know, but I do know the proof in the way my body reacts to things. And quite often I have to get blood tests just because of the extreme survival stuff I do. And that was the most telling for me because every time I gave, like had blood tests, my iron was out of control. My, my, um, like there were all these different levels of things that were out of control in the bloods. Um, and then I started, I went literally vegetarian one day to just steaks and like three or four a day. And within three months, my iron levels had leveled out and like all the little sort of, things that have been highlighted in my blood tests had all been fixed. So to me, you can't get better proof that the doctors were wrong about how I should treat that in the first place. I would certainly say, you know, uh, and, and again, I, I, I'm just kind of wondering if, you know, cause there's, there's sort of thresholds for diagnosis on this stuff. And, and I mean, orange skin can often be like, I had a, when I was in my surgical residency, we had a, we had this guy who's kind of crazy, ex-carnivore, not carnivore, he was a chiropractor that was doing orthopedics. And I went, he went from chiropractic school, orthopedic surgery, and was one of our lecturers. And he was, he was a spine surgeon. He was massively overdosing, I mean, not overdosing, well, maybe probably was on carrot juice. I mean, this guy drank like four liters of carrot juice a day. And we were like, man, you're, you're crazy, dude. And he was literally orange. And so I don't know if it's, you know, I'm not sure, you know, if, if you've got I, were you, I mean, I assume you weren't doing that. You weren't that wacky. No, no. So you weren't loading up on, you know, tons of beta carotene. And some, sometimes that'll change, change the skin color. And so I'm not, I would have to see, you know, if I can recall, maybe, maybe the iron will cause some yellowing or maybe even a jaundiced appearance. Uh, yeah. In particular, there's liver issues going on. So that may be an issue. Now, I mean, were you feeling sick? I mean, other than your skin being yellow and, and I mean, you're obviously still... Uh, other than ripping your hamstring off the bone, which is no fun, I can tell you, you probably didn't have it attached with reattachment would be my guess. Um, I've got four screws in my butt um, that reattached it back on. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's controversial in orthopedics whether reattach or not. And you know, it's the outcomes are anyway, but that's besides the point. So um, you've got this, you know, vegetarian irons out of whack and what, I mean, what made you, I mean, I mean, what made you say, I'm going to go vegetarian one day and I'm going to do this crazy carnivore stuff. And I don't know how long ago it was, was it, you know, I'm out here talking about carnivore now three years and people think I'm nuts and, 
now people, some people think I'm less nuts, but it's still kind of crazy. And so what, what kind of influenced you to make that decision then eventually? Uh, well, the thing for me was, so there, I mean, I, there was all these sort of misdiagnosis things. So I started getting heart palpitations and um, one of the things with the hemochromatosis diagnosis is that iron gets stockpiled around your organs, particularly your heart. And then if you take vitamin C, your heart starts to apparently shake the iron off and create these heart palpitations. So I had this diagnosis of that as well. Um, so doctors were like, well, you've got all this iron deposited around your heart and this vitamin C is now giving you these heart palpitations. And, and it was just this really, so I stopped vitamin C and, you know, and it was all sort of tumbling downhill. I was finding recovery was really difficult for me. So um, one of the extreme survival things I've done is a TV show called Naked and Afraid. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's Discovery's biggest hit TV show. I did first season. So I went into first season of Naked and Afraid, 21 days. I lost 30 pounds. Um, my recovery from that first show was, I would say, two years. Like with being a vegetarian. So with hormonal stuff, with muscle stuff, I was tearing muscles all the time. Being a stunt woman, I couldn't push myself at all. Like it was just craziness. So then I started, I got asked back on the show and I didn't want to do this big two years recovery thing. Um, and that was probably the time when a friend of mine discovered the carnivore diet and suggested I give it a go as, as this, um, I mean, just basically the cure for hemochromatosis. That was sort of where it came from. And I mean, I'm pretty stubborn, so I can do a lot when I'm tired. So I don't know if I reflect back on my time as a vegetarian and go like, oh, it, was, it was particularly difficult, but I did know I was sore all the time, 16 years of being a stunt performer, and I can't remember getting out of bed going, oh, I feel great. Whereas now, no matter what I physically do to my body, I don't even have lactic acid build up the next day, you know, and I contribute that high, like completely to, to the meat diet. I mean, it just continues to get more interesting. I don't know, Zach. I, I mean, I want to, um, I guess two questions. Well, I mean, one, I want, you know, when you're out and naked and afraid, and I've seen a little bit of that show, I don't really have a TV, so I don't, I can't really watch. I watch a clip here and there if I'm on a hotel room and it happens to be on. Yeah. That was like one, it kind of sucks because it wouldn't be very fun. But two, what, as a vegetarian, I mean, did you stick to vegetarian when you were in the show and how did you freaking survive? Or were you eating reptiles? And then, and then I want to delve in, I'm sure Zach, because we had a private investigator on the other day and we're like, well, hell, I don't know anything about private investigating. Let's ask questions. So yeah. I want to ask you questions about stunt woman stuff and, and let, let's get some of the behind the scenes on that because I'm sure both Zach and I are both curious about that. But tell me about what the hell you ate on Naked and Afraid as a vegetarian or how that turned out. And then we get into, let's get into the stunt woman stuff and then we can progress. Well, this is probably the time when I realized that meat was really good for me was um, doing that 21 days on Naked and Afraid because... I mean, it's really hard to discern the difference between poisonous vegetation and non-poisonous vegetation. Like you really have to know your stuff out there to be knowing what mushrooms to eat or what berries to eat, you know, but pretty much if anything moves and you can kill it, you'll eat it. So there's, um, that, makes, <laughs> that makes being vegetarian extremely hard out there because the things that you know you can eat are going to be all animals. So I remember the moment we killed this nutria, which is like this beaver rat combination. And it was probably the first meat I'd eaten in, I don't know, say 15 years. And I put that nutria in my mouth and it was almost like I could feel the difference it made to my body immediately. I was like, holy cow, and the energy. And it just felt like I was actually putting the nutrition my body needed into it. So that was probably a defining moment on that first naked and afraid. Um, and then I went straight back to being vegetarian and that sort of went downhill again. Um, but for me, like I just did another 21 days um, on their new concept called alone. So I was 21 days alone in the Amazon. Again, I lost 10 kilograms. The first thing I had when I got out was a pork chop. And I just went straight on to meat and I was training the day after I got home and 
then did another TV show where I raced a guy in the Tibetan plateau two months later. So I recovered from the same experience in a day and a half as opposed to two years. So that to me is when you go, well, you know, like this, this neat thing is the way to go for me, for my body. Guy, for, for any yeah. of those or either of those shows, are you doing anything? I guess this is maybe twofold. Are you doing anything before that to kind of prepare since you kind of know well, I'm going to definitely be losing at least some weight? Do you like, I don't know, batten up a little bit <laughs> leading into it? And then when you get in there, is it all just because I know I've, I'm not super familiar with like a Sean, I've seen some clips, but I haven't really dove into those shows. But I remember when Survivor first came out, they would get like, a ration of like rice or something like that and then, then they'd run out of that after a few days and they'd end up having to hunt fish and scavenge whatever they could find is what's kind of the protocol with that so the first thing is i never try and put weight on before the experience because um for me if i start eating a whole lot of calories and then suddenly deprive myself of all those calories then my body's like whoa 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 what happened like it's a big difference so for me, I get rid of everything that I'm going to crave out there. So any chemicals out of food, I do. I go sugar-free, gluten-free. I take out coffee three months beforehand. Like anything that my body may be addicted to, I ease it out and just end up eating pure and natural foods for about the last month before I go in. Because a lot of people go into these experiences and they're like, I'm dehydrated because I have a headache. I'm like, no, you're, you've got a headache because your body's craving these chemicals that we're used to in foods. Um, and so that's what I do. I strip it out all clean. And then I probably get down to about 800 calories a day before I go in. I don't get skinny, but, um, you know, like it'll, it'll just be a lean, clean diet. So then my body isn't, doesn't go into shock and it's not dealing with that. Um, this TV show, Naked and Afraid, is the most authentic survival show on TV. They give you nothing. You have... Um, you take in one survival item each, usually when there's two people, but the one I did, I did alone in the Amazon. That's so they gave me three survival items and you don't get any food. You don't get any help. You don't get any water. Like, so basically you just live on what you can find out there. And, you know, as soon as humans move into an area, most creatures move out. So you find that stuff like hunting becomes super hard and, you are designated into an area, so you can't roam too far. Um, and yeah, like life becomes pretty rough from that moment on. I, I would also imagine like after the show too, when you're relegated to eating what you can find, you kind of maybe find yourself in a position where if you would go back to a diet that had a, a well, just basically a standard American diet, or I guess you guys would maybe call a standard Australian diet. <laughs> um, yeah. It would be just like, it'd be maybe hard on your digestion just from, uh, the lack of variety that you have when you're out there just gathering your food. So going kind of with a carnivore approach those days after might actually be the ticket in terms of avoiding some of those potential after the math type issues, I guess. Yeah. A lot of people go, I want to go on that show because you lose like 30 pounds. I'm like, yeah. And then you put like 60 back on in the next week, you know, like people go back and they, they crave the junk food. Like the guy I was with when, uh, when I got out in Louisiana, he just wanted pancakes and waffles and, and fatty foods. And he was like, eight and eight and eight and eight. And so a lot of participants of the show balloon out and have a lot of trouble losing the weight. And I did as well. Like my metabolism was messed up when I was vegetarian. And then that's the really cool thing about being carnivore is I just came straight out and ate meat and fat, like animal fat. So I was like cream, um, like I was doing the yogurts, but I was also just like as much meat fats as I could. And I never struggled with ballooning out. So yeah, love it. <laughs> Let me, uh, Zach, I want to, cause I know Zach and I talked about this before, but there's a guy named Scott Jurek, who is a vegan, uh, you know, athlete, ultra runner. And he ran the Appalachian trail. And I know Zach intimated that it took the guy like two years to recover from that. Um, on a vegan diet. And I think what you're reflecting is something similar that when you're on a vegetarian or a meat-free diet, you can't take an insult. It takes you a long, long, long time to put that, rebuild that body because you know, you've had an insult. So I just want to leave that comment out there. And I'll, Zach, if you want to extrapolate on that. But the other thing I would say is what is the damn, how, what was the, 
I mean, to get food, what were some of the craziest things you had to do on, on either of the shows? On, you know, what was like the hardest way? And see if that rivals my whole food walking through the produce aisle. <laughs> I will take hunting in the Amazon over Whole Foods any day. <laughs> You've won hands down. We've got that. Um, um, I guess, you know, tadpole was probably the grossest thing I've eaten. Um, in Louisiana, we ate a, a fair few cotton mouths, so the water moccasins. So, again, you know, you're tangling with a venomous snake in order to get food. But... Um, you know, the non-venomous snakes weren't actually as delicious as the venomous snakes for some reason. So the cotton mouths had like, they were big stocky snakes. So there was that, um, in, so I've done three, I did naked and afraid of sharks. So we were actually competing with the sharks for food. Um, so that was, that was kind of crazy, but I like sharks, but I think, um, like in the Amazon, I was eating firefly larvae. That was sort of one of my main staples. Um, yeah, so food, honestly, if you see something, oh, and grasshoppers, you know, great. Anything that moves, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill and eat. And, um, but tadpole was the worst and the firefly larvae was probably the most delicious. <laughs> That's it. So I want to say one thing with like the foods you're eating, like the insects, I think makes sense in, in terms of you're just going to eat it and you're not going to try to like prepare it or anything like that. But when you're catching stuff, are you cooking it at all? Are you guys just eating that raw or? Well, the thing with insects is they carry really awful parasites. So um, even if it's a tiny grasshopper, I'm cooking that up. Oh, really? Um, okay. Oh, yeah, 100%. Grasshoppers carry gross intestinal parasites. Um, so grasshoppers I'm cooking up. Um, my sort of rule of thumb out there is if, it, if it's going to move, I'm going to cook it before I eat it because the parasites people come back with from raw meat out there are disgusting. So... Um, the firefly larvae, I didn't cook, but they're basically little maggots that all they do is eat the nut. And so they're just filled with nut juice. So they're actually really delicious. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've heard that these, I, when I was in New Zealand, I was out walking around with one of these Maori guys. We're going to go quote unquote hunting for pigs and we didn't find him. He was looking for these hoo-hoo grubs, which I don't know what the hell a hoo-hoo grub is, but apparently it's the same. And they say it tastes like peanut butter. I mean, it's like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it does, maybe it does. I, I Fortunately or unfortunately, we couldn't find any, and I was kind of not all that disappointed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm glad you told me because I'm very tempted to go eat raw grasshoppers, but I, I knowing that they have parasites, I'm probably not going to do that now. Uh, yeah, any <laughs> insects I would cook up. Um, but, yeah, the grubs are actually – it's really hard to get fat out in the wild. So fat's the one thing I really do crave when I get back. Um, and – grubs because they eat the nuts if they're in nuts they generally have a high fat content so that's why you sort of you know you can just chow them down so i mean if you i mean obviously i'm thinking you're in there eating you know tadpoles and grubs and grasshoppers and i mean if you had the opportunity to get a nice juicy pig or something like that that would be like heaven i would imagine well i set so many traps and snares out there they have these little pigs called peccaries in the amazon um ah oh, like your mouth are just water at the idea of actually chowing down on a big steak. And um, there's this really funny scene in the first Naked and Afraid where we managed to get a spear into this nutria in the log and then they have me bawling and it looks like I'm going, oh, I can't believe we're killing this animal. And the truth of the matter was like we got one spear in it, but we didn't kill it immediately. And I'm all for like if I'm going to kill something, I like to kill it immediately took like 15 minutes to get another spear in and I'm like day 17 and starving and I'm actually like bawling because I'm like we have to kill this thing <laughs> and of course they're like editing the vegetarian as I was like and then the next second I'm like this is delicious <laughs> so <laughs> it's reality tv but um so yeah. is like step one like now, now we're going down the rabbit hole I guess <laughs> step, step one is I guess you you got to find a way to make some fire right away if you got to cook everything is that something you just practice a lot so you know what to find and do that? Or is, do you bring like some of your survival, the, the very finite number of survival things you can bring? Are they conducive for fire making? Um, well, cause I've been in two really extremely wet conditions. So I've been in Louisiana and I was in the Amazon in wet season. So one of my items is always going to be a fire starter and mm -hmm. everyone's like, Oh, that means fire. But it's like, no, it means a spark. Like you can get a spark from that. And then, there's 
all of this knowledge and information that you have to know to make a bundle that's going to work for that spark. So, you know, you can give the average person a fire starter and I promise you in 21 days, they're not going to be able to make a fire because mm -hmm. they won't be able to get that spark to work. So, I mean, I can make fire by rubbing dry sticks together, but um, that requires a dry environment. Like everything needs to be fairly dry for that to be able to work. Um, for me anyway. Um, so yeah, I do take a fire starter if I know I'm going to be somewhere really wet. But then it's a toss up, you know, if you only get these three items, you have to be like, well, I mean, I would have killed for some fish hooks in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, that would have ensured me a food supply constantly. But fire, I have to boil water. You can't drink water straight out of the Amazon and I have to be able to cook my food. So that became my priority there. Could you, could you eat the fish raw if you had had hooks? I would definitely eat fish raw, yeah. So yeah, the hooks would have been ideal then because you could have, I guess you might want fire to stay dry and keep warm at night, but still anyway, but the fish hook would almost kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, uh, and it would have been a, a good resource, yep. So. I, I was just thinking, you know, like in the Amazon, I think, I mean, of all the things, I mean, would it seemed like it would drive me crazy would be, be the insects biting you. I mean, was that an issue that you, or did it just drive you nuts or how did you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting for me because Louisiana has mosquitoes like that can carry you off in the night. So <laughs> my first experience with Naked and Afraid was insane and you can't stop them. People like rub some mud on you and I'm like, yeah, well, that just attracts them because there's moisture all over you and then they eat between the cracks when the mud dries. So mud doesn't work, smoky fires don't work, putting green stuff on the fire doesn't work. And everyone's like, there's always a plant out there you can rub on yourself. I'm like, no, 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 there's not. <laughs> so um, I was in Louisiana with the bugs and it almost drove me crazy. And then I was in the Bahamas and I was like, this is going to be great. And then there were worse bugs in the Bahamas. They had the sand fleas as well as the mosquitoes. And then in the Amazon, everything moves, everything crawls. There's a billion different kinds of ants. There's always something on you and then at dusk and dawn the hum of thousands of mosquitoes is enough to drive you absolutely nuts um and yeah so i was fortunate um i did find a solution to that but the show is not out yet so i can't tell you what it is <laughs> it comes out on the 23rd <laughs> awesome that's great tell us a little bit about stunt business because i that's something again i'm, I'm not uh, I, I i you know i met a guy named Luke Hawk, who's an actor stuntman. I talked a little bit with him, but that's interesting stuff. What kind of stunts were you doing? Tell us a little, maybe some stuff that we, the average person wouldn't know about stunt, the stunt business. Um, so I was mainly a fighter. Um, like I'm five foot eight and I started stunts in Vancouver. So that was quite tall for a female in Vancouver. I'm quite short for an Australian female, but um, there wasn't any tall people uh, or tall women at that stage fighting. So I sort of fitted this little bit of a niche. Um, and I trained my butt off for like three years in all different forms of martial arts and weapons and then got lucky enough, um, Catwoman came to town and Sharon Stone needed a kickboxing double. So I sort of slotted into that. Um, I think the thing that people don't realise about stunts is, you know, everyone who says they do all their own stunts, production does not let people do their own stunts. Like the reason that you have stunt performers is... Um, if I get hurt, they'll just take the wig off me, put it on someone else, put the outfit on someone else and we can keep going. But as you see, like when Tom Cruise did his ankle not that long ago, it was like millions and millions of dollars for production to halt until he managed to recover and then they could continue filming. So a lot of the actors that say they do all their own stunts, you know, technically they're just not, they do a majority of what they can, but production won't risk an actor um even if it's just a little stunt so that's one thing that a lot of people might not know yeah i mean I, and i think that's uh, that's interesting and i guess i'm not sure i know there's still there's no award like academy award for stunt still it's still kind of one of those things where they just kind of you guys are expendable we don't care about you and then you know they got the wardrobe guy i'm like what the heck <laughs> <laughs> and sound and makeup and you're like right, what? Right. yeah you got somebody risking their life and now we got the you know and then we got the wardrobe guy the makeup guy getting an award i mean that's come on man you know and that is a point too like people don't realize we do risk our lives like it sounds silly but even when i say it you know people would say have you ever felt like you're gonna die i'm like quite often you go to set and you're like well today might be the day you know like 
you only have to be out by an inch sometimes and that has massive consequences. So um, it is a, a, a job where you do risk your physicality and your safety on a regular basis. Um, and yeah, no award, but I think that's because people still like to pretend we don't exist. So this comes back to the I do my own stunts thing, you know, like actors want you to think that's really Captain America. It's like, we know you're not Captain America. <laughs> so no. it's like, we're okay to suspend that disbelief. So maybe we can suspend the disbelief that the actor's actually doing all the action as well. We've all seen the behind the scenes DVDs these days. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of reminded, I don't know, Zach, you may or may not remember. I mean, uh, Kai, you may, there's a guy named Benny Hill he used to do a show, Benny Hill show. Mm -hmm. And he would do that, you know, it was so obvious that he had, you know, he'd go in there to pretend like he's doing a flip and, you know, it was so obvious that there was another guy. It was, just, it, was just, it was a parody. But I mean, that's kind of what I think about, you know, these guys in there, but they've gotten better with the CGI stuff. And, you know, I'm sure that it blends more seamlessly. But at the end of the day, that's all you're seeing, you know. I mean, I always say, if you can tell I'm there, I'm not doing my job. You yeah. know, so for me, it was really important to be able to look at the way the actress was moving in and mimic like as much as I could. So it is a lot of acting involved as well. You know, like if I walk like Kai and then there's suddenly, you know, Sharon Stone's there, it's just going to be this like completely um, non-seamless fit. So um, yeah, if I do my job, you don't know I'm doing my job. That's interesting. I suppose it's kind of like anything where, you know, you just people think like, oh, well, they're doing all like the action stuff or the jumps and things like that. But really there's a lot more, a lot more like fine, fine tuned things going into it. Um, what would you say with this from the stunt career was like the most either like dangerous or nerve wracking stunts you had to do? Um, like I'm a bit of a control freak, you know, like for me, um, everyone's like, you must be a daredevil. And I'm like, well, yes, like I am. I'm not like an adrenaline junkie, but I'm also really, really careful with my own personal safety. So I like, I'm always double checking. I'm like, I was a rock climbing person, so I can look at my rigging. Um, so the most dangerous stunts were the ones that were really unpredictable, um, where I had no control over what was going on. Um, there was a scene in like X-Men 3 where um, they're storming, the mutants are storming Alcatraz. And so you're in this tiny little courtyard because they've made Alcatraz courtyard and they're throwing these real cars up into the air, like they're blasting them off cannons. And then they have um, petrol or gas bombs in them and they're blowing up these bombs in midair. And then the cars are falling down into the courtyard where there's people and we're those people. So, like, they've got three cars in the air at once and you're just like, you don't know where they're going to land or what they're going to do. And the courtyard's quite small and there's a lot of people, so you don't want to run into someone while you're trying to run away from these cars. And then the stunt coordinator, like, turns to me, he's like, could you be dragged backwards by a few people? Like, you're injured. And so I'm literally going, left, right, as these people are trying to drag me. It was just like... And that was one day I was like, I should have probably said goodbye to mom and dad today, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> so they literally have calls, cars falling out of the sky. And you guys, that's, you know, I, I thought, you know, I would assume that's more CGI stuff, but that's, that's really. And it looks CGI. That's the yeah. worst thing is like, you're risking your life and you look at these little ants in the courtyard and you're like, oh, that's probably fake. It's like, no, 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 that was us. Wow. That's amazing. And one of, one of the cars actually went too far and it went over the safety barrier and it went through this warehouse and wedged above craft services where everyone was eating. So it was just like suddenly this car was like halfway through the wall. Everyone's like got their hot dogs going. <laughs> so you never know. Are you still, are you still doing some of this stuff or are you, are you kind of stepped away from that? Um, so I tore the hamstring off four years ago and I was working on my recovery, but I've only done the carnivore diet for a couple of those years. And the first critical healing moments of that injury, um, sort of set it up wrong. So I've just recently had to, um, have it reoperated on. Um, and so they went back into that site and, and this to me, it, Look, as I said, I don't know the science behind this diet, but being a vegetarian, I was in a wheelchair for eight weeks after the initial operation. This time around, I was off crutches two weeks in. And it's like they cut through the same muscle. They mess with the same nerves. The only thing they didn't do was they didn't remove the screws or anything. But it was like a major, major surgery. And with collagen and 
meet. <laughs> I'm like two months in now and like two months in last time I was still in a wheelchair. So to me, I'm like the recovery aspect of it all is phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty nice, uh, you know, case control comparison because usually revision operations are harder and mm -hmm. the recovery is, is often longer because you are dealing with scar tissue and, you know, so on and so forth. So that, that is, uh, you know, again, pretty, pretty interesting to see. I mean, and I've always maintained and, and pretty much any surgeon will maintain that nutrition is going to help with healing. The problem is we don't know what, what's nutrition. Uh, you know, and I think it, to me, it's intuitively obvious. What are we trying to heal? We're trying to heal a bunch of muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we need to build that muscle? We need the same elements that are in muscle. So why not just eat a bunch of it? You know, I mean, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's, maybe it's too simple uh, that it can't be that easy. You know, I mean, it's just like, oh, it's got to be too, it's got to be more complex than that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, repeatedly, and I know Zach talks when he, when, when he goes from running his hundred mile crazy world record setting stuff, he goes on to a, correct me if I'm wrong, Zach, a carnivore diet or carnivorous diet and his recovery is better. I mean, than it was before on a, on a maybe a more carbohydrate based approach. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's the application I use it the most for is after a, a big effort or even in training. If I, if I do a big enough training block, I'll build in like a complete day off and I'll, I'll sometimes flex in, you know, basically a full carnivore day or two when I'm kind of just focusing primarily on recovery. And I think a lot of it is, uh, a lot of it is just like the swelling, the reduction in swelling. And I don't know, I wouldn't be able to tell you if that's like an increase in the, or I should say a decrease in the time it takes to kind of like heal and start moving that stuff out. So it's not neat anymore, or if it's just not accessing that as much. Cause it's like the, the thing that I always find interesting is like after some of these big runs or these ultra marathons, it's, it's more just like your legs get tight from the swelling and sometimes like fluid buildup and things like that. So some of the pain is just because you can't bend your knees all the way or you can't squat down and pick something up. So you're just kind of more like rigid. And I find like when I'm really either like kind of strict keto or carnivore after, after a race, something like that, I just have a little more mobility uh, right away, even the next day sometimes. So it is, it's interesting. Maybe they'll look into that someday if ultra running gets more popular. <laughs> I thought it was getting popular. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is getting popular, but it's, it's also, you know, there, I think that's one of those things where it, there's so many different studies you could do on it and then you got to get the funding for it. And yeah, so it's, uh, it, it probably would need some other application outside of just ultra running before there's a real good look at it, but who knows? Mm. I mean, for me personally, so I'm like 46 now. This is what I love about your stuff, Sean, is you're just like, look at this, look at that. <laughs> like, you know, you're getting better with age, you know. So I'm 46. I did 16 years of stunts. I never got employed for easy stunts. Like I got smashed the snot out of like, you know, broken shoulders, broken ribs, broken hands, like just smashed to pieces. Like the hamstring torn off. I should be getting up every day and being like, Oh, that hurts. You know, like I can feel that. Like there's arthritis there. There's this or that. I have none of that. Like, to me, that is a miracle. You know, the amount of people, like when I, I smash like a bit about this big off the head of my shoulder, my humerus here, doctors are like, oh, you're going to have arthritis in that. You know, shoulder injuries, oh, they'll plague you for years. Like nothing. Like I'm stronger than ever in my shoulders, in my body. Nothing aches. Even the hamstring, like it's post-surgery. So there's a bits and pieces, but... I don't, I don't have those arthritic pains. Now, part of me, like I do do the cold water plunges every day. Like I do the sort of Wim Hofish thing because I find that reduces that inflammation. But I truly 100% believe it's a combination of the cold therapy and the carnivore diet that means at 46, like people have a hard time keeping up with me even after all those injuries and and issues so yeah all right folks this episode of human performance outliers podcast is brought to you by butcher box butcher box is a meat delivery company that brings you high quality beef chicken pork salmon and scallops 
What does this mean? All products are natural and humanely raised or sustainably wild caught, as is the case with their salmon and scallops. If you are concerned with how the animals you eat were raised, rest assured, ButcherBox partners with farmers who are inspired by Dr. Temple Grandin, a member of the Humane Farm Animal Care Program's scientific committee. Their beef is 100% grass-fed and grass-finished, the chicken is organic, and the pork is heritage breed with no added sugar. So head over to ButcherBox.com and place an order today, and don't forget to enter promo code HPO for a discount. Thank you for supporting one of our long-standing sponsors. Now, back to the show. Yeah, I mean, that's that's powerful testimony. I mean, I, I, I literally, I feel the same way. I'm in there. I was just cruising around, walking around with 450 pounds in my hands today, doing a little stroll around the gym. And, you know, and all the other old guys are in there. Barely, they can't even walk them. They're, they're kind of hobbling around. <laughs> it's just kind of... You know, it's like the contrast becomes pretty obvious there. So tell us a little bit about now, today, you're out in the, do you live out in the, in, I mean, I don't know, the, the bush, the outback, whatever, are you out there running around with the, with the, the you know, the aboriginals, you know, with their adolatals and hunting, you know, what, what's going on with this? Tell us about that. Your life. Well, I'm heading off um, this afternoon, actually, to go hunting with my bow. So, um, as I said, I do try and get out there and provide my own, um, my own meat for myself. Like, um, one of the things that I really feel as a vegetarian is that you tend to supplement your diet with stuff with chemicals in it. Um, you know, like it's great. Oh, look, there's this meat. I can eat chicken nuggets that aren't chicken. I can eat bacon. That's not bacon. And, and the thing I really found was the, the chemicals in all that stuff scare the crap out of me now. Um, because being able to go and hunt my own meat straight off is, you know, the only person that's touched that is me and these goats, they run wild. So they're not given hormones or anything like that. So yeah, heading out today to, to hunt. And then, um, basically my life is pretty random. Um, I just finished two shows at the end of last year. So, um, the only female to do a survival show with Ed Stafford called First Man Out. So um, that's coming out in March. And then my Naked and Afraid Alone episode is coming out at the end of February. So I'm heading to America to do some press and stuff for that, but also to do some more hunts and, um, yeah, see where things go from there. But when I'm here, I live on my motorbike, basically. I have um, my bow and arrow fits under my leg on one side of the motorbike and I just um, cruise around and meet cool and interesting people and um, yeah, pretty you, random one, life. One thing I think would be kind of cool to dive into would be just like what you do physically to prepare for some of these endeavors you've had. I mean, when you just look at it, um, there's so many like kind of, there's a lot of variance from the stunt woman stuff to these shows to hunting is there a routine you like to do or rock climbing? I'll add in there too. Is there a routine that you do or is just like doing these activities kind of just like unintentionally? I don't want to say unintentionally, I guess it'd be attentionally getting you prepared for these, these type of things. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the common thread for all of them is a good mental attitude, you know, like, being able to get back up again when you fall down. And literally that is with stunts. You know, my, my big thing with stunts was you could beat the crap out of me and I would stand back up again and be like, oh, you need another take? You know, like even, <laughs> even when I broke my shoulder, I did like eight more takes onto that shoulder um, for a stunt I was doing before the stunt thing was over. So for me, my preparation is a, a lot of mental stuff. Um, there's this whole thing about being uncomfortable. Like I don't think that we are uncomfortable in this day and age anymore. So, um, you know, I find if I can just put myself in a position where I'm constantly uncomfortable and things, you know, things just um, challenge you in little ways. Like even on my motorbike, now when it rains on my motorbike, I'm like, well, now I'm getting wet instead of fussing about it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm... Um, and I'm constantly learning new things like survival is this open ended book where you could learn for a hundred years and still not know everything. So um, my preparation for that stuff is to just do it. You know, quite often we know the theories behind things, but people don't commit to doing it. And um, 
So I'll go and I'll play with fire and I'll play with shelters and I'll sleep in, in the dirt and I'll just, and I'll hunt and I'll learn how to chop up things properly. I mean, I'm still, still ever learning and there's still always so much to learn. So that's my prep life. You need to sign, your, you need to sign yourself up for the gnarliest ultra marathon. <laughs> that's like the attitude. You need. Well, see, me with running, you know, like I'm always like, if you see me running, you should start running too because there's something chasing me. <laughs> that's, that's my thing. I mean, I'm really good endurance, but like not so fast. <laughs> well, there's some really long ones. You just got to go really slow for a long period of time. <laughs> well, I mean, sign me up. I can totally do the, the torturous long ones. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a race over in Morocco called uh, Marathon de Sable where it's a stage race that I can't remember how many days it is, but it's basically through like sand dunes and it's just, it's just miserable and you have to carry all your nutrition. So like people are getting to the end of it and they're just like, you know, they're, they're just like losing weight and running out of rations and things like that. So they're, High output, low energy input. I think you'd probably be a slam dunk for that. You've got all the all the rehearsal. <laughs> yeah, we well, see the thing that fascinates me about this survival stuff is like you go through these phases in twenty one days. Twenty one days is an awesome amount of time, you know. Like, by and this was the thing that first started me wondering if I was eating the right stuff and doing the right things because by day seventeen and I felt like a million dollars, you know, like I'd lost that 10 kilograms and everyone's like oh my gosh you're so skinny but I think that's where we're meant to be almost like we're meant to be hunting our own food and just eating what we can get there and not having these chemicals and like I felt at day 17 when everyone's wanting to tap out I felt like I was living the life I should be living um and that was when I started to get curious about this other way, you know? It's like I feel so incredible in, in what most people would call a very deprived state. Uh, yeah, that is, uh, you know, I mean, again, we, we talk about humans and our, and our evolutionary past and what we might have lived in. Obviously, we depended upon hunting for much of our existence. We would have we would have never survived if we weren't, ex you know, exceptionally good hunters. And I wonder, do you get any chance to interact with, say, I don't know if there are even if many of them are still around, some of the Aboriginals that still mm. live in a traditional fashion? And what kind of knowledge do they have? Uh, I mean, you know, gathered through countless generations of living out in there and, and living in their environment, they've got to know everything about everything out there. I would guess. I mean, what do I, can you comment on that? Um. There are very few that are living in a very traditional state now. Um, and, I, and I get it because what happened was we came and we're like, look how easy it is to go to the shop and buy this thing instead of putting this time and energy and effort into trying to hunt it and then not having successes. You know, sometimes you will go hungry, sometimes you won't. But there's this huge movement now of um, the indigenous getting back to the land and back to their roots. Um, so I think I sort of came up in a time where there wasn't a lot of that connection, but now they're making it very important. Um, and I have had, you know, had the honour of having a lot of interaction with them. And um, as you're walking through the world with them, you just know that they see the world in a completely different way. Um, you have like, and that's the way I program myself before I go out into these survival things too. You start to look at trees and plants and animals as resources um, and opportunities rather so much than, um, than just things that are in the environment. Um, and it is my aim to spend a lot more time with them if possible, just because the knowledge they have and their relationship with the land is just so powerful. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, what, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of think, you know, we've got this huge contrast. I mean, you've been doing this diet for what, two years now, is that right? Two years. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had any sort of negatives thus far? Has it all been good? And what's, what's been the deal with that? And let me ask you, cause you're hunting, I guess you're eating a lot of goat. I mean, when you go out to hunt, you're just like, I'm going to go get a goat or I'm going to get whatever I can get. I mean, how does that work for you? 
I'm getting whatever I can get. Um, there's this big challenge between me and some hunting mates because I don't like to hunt just to kill. And there's a huge feral fox problem in Australia. And apparently fox tastes so gross. But um, this hunt on the weekend, I've, I've said if I kill something, I'm going to eat it. So <laughs> there's this huge challenge about am I going to shoot and kill and eat this, this fox. Um, as for negative effects, I feel like the most negative effects have been um, human judgment, to be honest. Um, that's the hardest thing for me is how threatened people feel by this whole diet. Um, and I, I really struggle with the fact that being a vegan and a vegetarian is something that everyone applauds and yet my food choices are, um, are looked down upon, you know, and I always try and put the hunting on, and the processing of the animals in a really honest light and I'm always hashtagging sustainable living because let's be honest, it is the most sustainable form of food gathering that you can have. Um, yeah, so no negative effects on the body. I build muscle fast. I can push myself till I can't even stand up that night and the next day I'm not sore. I'm recovering from injuries. Um, like I only, I have very few gray hairs. Like for me at 46, I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> you know, like my skin looks and feels great from the animal fats. Um, I can hardly put fat on if I tried, you know, like I, I'll have my, coffee with two big tablespoons full of cream because I feel like the animal fats are important to me and I'm not putting on weight I'm like shredding so hormonally again like I'm 46 I'm hitting that thing where everyone's like ah oh, post premenopausal and honestly after the first naked and afraid five years ago I had such issues with hormones and I don't have any of that now so you know, no negative effects on the physical level at all. Um, just it, I struggle mentally with the judgments that people pass on you, even if you're not killing your own meat, even if you just go to a pub and are like, I just had the steak, thanks. And people are like, why aren't you having pizza? It's like, I just don't feel good if I eat that, you know. So it's more... It's more those struggles and also I find like I don't judge anyone for how they eat, yet people get rabid at you for with judgment for eating meat. So yeah, it's probably more that for me. It yeah, is I mean I get sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say it's just interesting that like the hunting aspect is like a step above the buying of it in terms of egregiousness from the peers because like, especially for you, if you're hunting invasive species, that's like the most sustainable thing you can do. <laughs> and they're just baiting them. They're going out in helicopters and shooting these goats and leaving them to rot there. So I'm just taking a resource that's already there mm -hmm. and using it. You know, the interesting thing for me though, is like I learned how to make leather. Um, I was making cord, like rope out of the intestines of the animals. Like I was using the whole animal. I was using the brain to tan the hide. I was eating its organs and the meat. And I was putting it all on Instagram. And I actually had vegans and animal activists writing to me and saying, this is great. This is how we should be eating. So I'm like, a little bit of education can help people see it a bit differently as well. Yeah, I'm just wondering, because uh, we, uh, I, you know, I'm over in the U.S. and I get a lot of, it seems like Australia and maybe the U.K. equally so have gone like crazy vegan. There's a crazy activist. There's people yes. attacking farms, blocking traffic. You know, they're kind of combining it with their, the climate people and saying, you know, we're, you know, we're out there. The animals are burning the entire Australian, you know, outback or wherever it's, wherever the fires are burning. And it's, you know, there's, there's so much more that goes into this stuff. And we just, we just all, it's so one-sided. And I really, I'm, first I want to applaud you for standing up and saying, look, I'm a human being. This is my food. This is what's kept me healthy. This is what makes me personally healthy, which I think is also extremely important because, you know, you can go from uh, hemochromatosis, sick, hormones wrecked, 
feeling awful or hurting to feeling wonderful just by including animal products and in your case pretty much all animal products so that says something but i think as more and more people of influence you know uh you take this and i'm getting more and more people of significant influence that are coming to me you know i'm, I'm getting them to say hey i'm doing i'm doing the diet and i'm trying to encourage these people you got to speak out you can't be you know beaten down by these people that are wanting to, to what i call virtue signaling and that oh i'm better than everyone else and if you don't eat a plant-based diet you're ruining the world and shame on you we just got to step up to this stuff i think and we just all have to step up and say look i'm going to keep eating meat because that's what human beings do and i don't care if you can make a pill uh, it's, it, it doesn't work as well so anyway i applaud you for doing that and it is it is hard you know like you are a social media personality you know but I find being authentic with it, I don't actually cop too much flack for it. You know, I explain why I'm doing it. And if someone does come at me, I just am like, you know what, this is, this is my way, or I'll just block them, you know, <laughs> block or delete. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, so I feel like it's a time to be firm about what makes me healthy and what makes me strong. And, and to be honest, it scares me so much looking at this vegan mo movement and how powerful it is. You know, and I'm not saying don't, don't be vegan. Do have at it. Do whatever makes you happy. But don't force your views onto other people. You know, like there's this freedom of choice that's being taken away from us right now. Like when you see the schools that, and the universities and, you know, I went into the gold club for Virgin the other day and every meal was vegan. And I was just like, okay, so now you're, you're taking my right of choice away. Like where this whole freedom of speech and this whole freedom of to live the way you want to live. It's almost like as long as you live the way we want you to live, and, um, and, you know, kids in schools shouldn't be subjected to a vegan only diet. You know, you should be able to have choice still. And so that's what scares me about this movement. And that's why I feel so passionate about what you guys are doing is um, there needs to be a voice on the other side to bring some balance into this situation. Yeah, I mean, we had a really nice uh, podcast just before this earlier. We got two really, I mean, I, I think we have a third podcast yet today and really just wonderful stuff. Uh, and the guy before us uh, was talking, you know, he's, he's a regenerative farmer. He's out in Idaho. He's growing. He's, he's putting carbon back in the soil. His productivity is more than a regular farmer. I mean, he's actually making more yield, which I think is fascinating. But we've got this other options out there that we are not fully exploring. And really, I mean, the vegan movement while this is the point of the spear, I mean, this is where we're getting this ethical save the planet stuff. We really, I mean, it's, when you look at where it's coming from, you know, and, I, and Bobby Risto, one of our guests, it says it's really an astroturf. It's not a grassroots. It is a corporate funded, uh, these people that want to sell you alternate proteins and they want to make this a hundred billion dollar market, which they projected. And they're putting all of this effort, all of this media, all of this research, bias research, mind you, that is saying that, we need to stop eating meat and guess what we're going to eat and said you're going to eat our plant-based fake pea protein soy isolate uh you know whatever's cheapest product and we, we're going to make a lot of money off this and i think this is really what's going on and, and you know but we do have we still have a choice i don't know how long we're going to continue to have a choice and i see people like they're it's literally like they're shooting themselves in the foot they're blindly like giving up their liberty uh, so they can quote unquote save the planet are being told to do that. And, and even if you believe that man is changing the planet, and I know maybe many people find that controversial, but even if you accept that we are, and certainly we shouldn't be littering and polluting, and I, and I think we all agree that it's not cattle that's doing it. I mean, we could certainly make a huge argument for fossil fuels. I mean, even sources of methane, we're discovering new sources of methane every single week, it seems like. It's, oh, wow, we found all this new greenhouse gas we never accounted for. And we keep saying, what's the cows? It's the cows. And it's, it's just beyond ridiculous. You know, we had, who was it? We had on a couple, you know, last week we had a guy, uh, oh, McPherson, McPherson, you know, he said, mm, yeah. six years, you know, <laughs> we're all in things anyway. So it's, it's, you know, this, this is kind of, this kind of gets crazier and crazier. And anyway, that's just my rant. I'm in, I'm in a ranting mood today. <laughs> I like it. We need more rants. <laughs> I mean, I, I just um, I feel like there's a lot of information that's being blocked as well. You know, like the whole 
um, side effect of the like just the wheat farming and all that sort of thing. Like, so that's why I think the information, getting the information out there of like how many animals actually get killed to make the crops and how many acres of rainforest are getting destroyed, not for cattle farming, but for soybeans. And, you know, it's like, it feels like there's these blinders on that. It's like that information, no, 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 no. But like anything that proves, like that game changes thing, anything that proves a point, um, is focused on <laughs> this is really funny so i was in so i had just had the operation and i was like i'm just gonna eat meat and this is how i'm gonna heal myself and someone's like this this archer so like a bow guy I put on my thing he's like oh my god you totally have to watch game changes and then like put all this stuff in your diet and i thought he was joking and i'm like i'm not rude to people on on instagram or anything but i'm like ha 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 yeah right and then, <laughs> and then i realized i'm like you're a bow hat like what <laughs> like i realized he was fully serious and i was like oh sorry no i'm just gonna do the opposite of everything they say on that <laughs> <laughs> That is, you, know, you, you kind of see that watch game change, watching that trick socks rentally and, and, and base your life upon that, that silliness, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of humorous, but you know, it's effective. I mean, this is what we have. We have this, this propaganda. Do you get, I mean, as a female, are you getting any like pushback for, for, for being a hunter? Or, I mean, is that, does that, I mean, you're obviously in the minority. I mean, most hunters are males. I mean, this, that's just the way it is, but I mean, I, I think it's, wonderful what you're doing but i mean do you get any resistance from the males you're not one of the guys or do you i do you just hunt by yourself or how does that how does that work well i mean i get more resistance from um male hunters partners to be honest mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes i do hunt alone mainly because <laughs> because not a lot of women like me going out with their men but um the men are great like i especially the guys, I've met this really nice sort of core group of hunters in Australia that are just so supportive of me getting out there and doing it. And they're just excited to share their knowledge with anyone. I mean, my biggest thing that I have is people underestimating me for being female. Like, so, um, but I've had that all my life with stunts as well and any, any outdoors things. Um, so I really had it there for a while because I was posting up all these things on Instagram with these people that I was doing things with that it just happened to be men because not a lot of women are doing what I'm doing. And everyone was like, oh, it's so good you've got all those men out there taking you out on all those trips. And I was like, <laughs> like hang on a minute. Like, I'm teaching them stuff, you know, like not the other way around. So then um, at the beginning of last year, I went out for three weeks and went solo off grid for three weeks and just hunted and lived off what I was, um, lived off what I was getting with the bow um, just to be like, look, there's nobody else here. Like I'm killing, and I just ate goat really and anything else I could scavenge, but for three weeks. And so I would kill a goat and I would process the whole thing and I did it all on camera so everyone could see what I was doing. And I, you know, you could see me cutting up the goat and trying to figure out which bits were which and like, you know, getting the brain out of the skull. And then I would process that goat over the next three days and make leather out of its skin and do all sorts of things with the rest of the goat. And then I'd run out of goat because I could, apparently I can eat a goat in three days. And then <laughs> I would get another goat. So I just did that for three weeks by myself just to sort of be like, look, yeah, I'm a girl and I'm not so big, but I'm out here and I'm able to do these things by myself. So that's probably the biggest that I get. But yeah, the hunting community hasn't given me any grief and, um, and the general public hasn't either, which is wonderful. I think people who follow me accept that I'm strangely eccentric and um, appreciate all that makes me different, which is, you know, which is wonderful. There's a, when I read about, and obviously I've, I've read so much about meat and historical populations and, you know, I wrote and written a book about all this and stuff, but, you know, it's rumored that, you know, uh, Mongolians would routinely eat an entire sheep in something like 24 hours, which I was like, holy cow, or at least 80, 10 pounds in one sitting. And so you're saying me as a female who's, you know, you know, normal size is eating a whole goat in three days is, is pretty <laughs> impressive. And I mean, I'm not sure how much, how, how big the goats are you're hunting, but I mean, they, they're going to be a certain, you know, they're various sizes, but uh, how much do you eat a day typically? I mean, we had a Ella Bruce on here who's a female and she's more of a bodybuilder type. 
Uh, but you know, she's a hundred and I think she said she was like 70 kilos or something like that. Not huge, but she was eating five pounds. I mean, two and a half kilos a day some days. And that's, that's kind of what I was eating. And I'm, you know, I'm 110 kilos. And so, I mean, how much do you eat as a, I don't want to know what you weight it. Well, you can tell us your weight if you want, but how much are you eating a day typically? Or is, is so it, I'm, yeah, I'm probably 130 pounds, whatever that is. And like just under 60 kilograms. Um, I mean, when I was hunting the goat, I was doing a lot and I was eating goat for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Like I didn't have anything else out there. So that's how come I could eat the goat in three days is because it was all I was eating for three meals a day. Um, I don't do that one meal a day thing um, with the carnivore. That doesn't work for me at the moment um, just because of the starvation that I've put my body through. Um, so I, I do an early early dinner and then a late breakfast but i can't i just can't do the one meal just yet but um i would probably eat on an average day like um, maybe four or five steaks um and like you know you get the the minced meat or ground beef or whatever like in the packets like a normal size i mean i wouldn't know how much that was but i would eat one of those a day like i can go through a whole thing of ground beef in a day <laughs> and then I add some brains or I put some liver in it occasionally but that's just sort of I just love the food plain and simple you know when I um first got out of that first naked and afraid I was like can I just have some plain yogurt and I ate the yogurt and my mouth just blistered all over like so the chemicals that we put in the foods are really obvious mm -hmm. when you have sort of really cleaned your system out like that too which is why I get worried about the chemicals that we're choosing to put in our bodies. And this diet is the least chemicals that you can, you know, I try and eat pretty fresh meat and yeah, but a lot, I eat a lot more than people expect. Like I'll go to the pub and get the biggest steak I can. And everyone's just looking at me and I'm like, like do you want some salad with that? I'm like, no, <laughs> like, I can eat a lot. <laughs> so you're, you're mostly doing kind of like a nose to tail type of an approach um, when you're not out there just surviving. Yeah, I'm trying to. Um, yeah, doing the best I can with that stuff, yeah. What's the best sort of wild animal that you've eaten that would that actually taste good? It would be surprising. I mean, uh, is there anything out there? I mean, obviously, there's, you said fox taste, potentially tastes horrible. I mean, it seems like the predators don't taste as good as the prey animals, and probably there's a reason for that. But what has been your experience? I mean, I assume you've eaten a variety of different things. What's the worst thing you ate? the best thing you ate or something that might be surprising to us? Um, the worst thing was definitely tadpole for some reason. It was just disgusting. Um, the, I mean, I love the goat here. Like it eats salt bush. So you get pre-flavored meat and everyone has this idea that goat is really a tough gamey kind of taste, but it really isn't. I mean, that nutria in the swamp too. So that little beaver rat thing Oh my gosh, like it was a chickeny kind of white meat that was delicious. But I don't know if that was delicious just because I was starving. <laughs> um, and, and that was the surprising thing for me as well. Like everyone says, you know, when you've been vegetarian and then you go back, you have to ease into it with white meats and this and that. I went straight from vegetarian to deer, which is kind of meant to be sort of gamey. And it just showed me that my body wanted that because I loved the taste of it again from the very first second I ate it. So um, I don't mind the gaming meats at all. You know, I love the deer and oh, kangaroo is so delicious. If you ever get it, have you ever tried kangaroo? You know, I'm not, it's not something we readily get in the U S for, for obvious reasons, but I mean, I, my understanding is it's very lean um, and it's yeah. real rich flavor. If I get down there, I'll, I'll definitely try it. If I if I get down to Australia, so but no, I'm not. Zach, have you have you been Australia and had kangaroo? I can't. I don't no, know. I haven't, but it'd be something worth trying. I think. I think I've had ostrich in a burger at one point in my life. I mean, <laughs> that was yeah. popular, you know, 15 years ago here, and you know, we had some people. Who, I think you actually, I think they raise ostrich in the U.S. still. I think there's some farms, mm -hmm. but. Um, yeah, no, I haven't tried. There's a lot of things I have tried and a lot of things I haven't. I'm open. I usually when I travel, I'm, I'm always willing to try whatever. And sometimes it's pretty gross to be honest, but I'm like, I'll try it, you know, <laughs> and yeah. see if I find some. When I was, I was really surprised when I was just in Malaysia, the one thing I did, had no idea people ate was jellyfish. And so hmm. I had some jellyfish and I was like, 
this is odd. And it, the, the real, the one surprising thing to me was it was very sort of crunchy. And I was like, I didn't, wouldn't expect jellyfish to be crunchy. Uh, but it was, you know, it was, you know, that was something new. And I had, I had, you know, sheep's testicles out in Iceland and shark, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And, and honestly, none of it was stuff I would crave at home. <laughs> so edible though like, I mean that's the thing for me sometimes it's like if you're hungry enough you'll eat anything that's that's what I think anyway yeah I mean I, I mean and you know I mean naked and afraid is a whole different that's the thing I you know you hear these vegans why would you eat an animal if you don't have to I'd say well you know go on naked and afraid for three weeks and see how you hold up with that you know and, and again that's not, obviously most people aren't in that situation but that's that's a true human nature you know, when you get out there and you're, you're tired of eating all the insects because they're not, I mean, how many insects would you have to eat to, to be full? I mean, I mean, it'd be a constant, I mean, yeah. you know, relative, relative, can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine if you had this big old giant mastodon, you're just like, man, <laughs> come on, dude, I, you know, I got to just kill one of them and I can eat for three months, you know, it's like, what, some what, people, what some, would, yeah, what would be the decision making process? I'm going to eat bugs and maybe some berries and nuts, or I'm going to eat this big mastodon. Where I mean, it's like a no brainer to me, but you know, that's anyway. Some of the people on Naked and Afraid get put in areas where they have like buck and deer, like especially in Africa. And I'm always like, oh, like I could have lived for the 21 days of that, you know, because I'm eating the firefly freaking maggots in the Amazon. I'm like, this is not fair. Like, I, if there was big game, that's all I'd be focused on, um, on going for. I mean, the, the other interesting thing that I think is like a lot of people thought being a girl, I was going to hunt something and be like, oh my God, I'm killing it. And you see those people that hunt and then they've got the tears and things like that. And I was literally like for the longest time, I thought something inherently in me was broken because I can't even tell you how right it felt to, to kill my first goat. Like, and it wasn't one of those like, I am dominant over this animal. Like, you know, it wasn't about killing. It, it was just about like, like, holy shit, this is how we should be living. Like I've never never felt something so right in my life. Like it was this deep primal thing for me. And I didn't look at that thing and be like, I just took the life. And I don't step on ants. Like I'm, I'm like not somebody that just like, I'll carry the spiders out of the house. Like I don't kill things, but when you're killing the food to eat it, there is, there's nothing that felt so right or primal to me in that moment. Um, and I mean, I take full responsibility for it. I'm not the type of person that kills something and then say, can you just clean that up for me? Like I'll get in there and do the rest of the stuff as well. But yeah, it was, I feel like if people had that connection to the food they were eating, then more people would realize that that's sort of the way we should be eating. Yeah. And I think there's a visceral, I mean, just eating, you get this visceral satisfaction from meat, like no other thing. And I think that it is so ingrained in who we are, you know, and I think it's, it's trying to be beaten out of us by, you know, co corporate interest, quite honestly. And so, unfortunately, there's 7 billion of us, 7.7 .7 billion of us, or however many, and, and you know, we, if we all were hunting, there'd be zero wild animals left in, in, in uh, you know, I mean, that's the reality of the thing. And so, we have to figure out a way to make you know, make it sustainable. And some people are going to argue, let's just stop eating animals and let's all eat our soybean burgers and, and, and shut up and be happy. And I think there's obviously a mix for both. And the nice thing that we're hearing is like with guys uh, like we have on these regenerative ag guys, that when they do the thing with even the domesticated animals and they do the graze in the right way, the wild animals come in. Mm -hmm. the wild animals, you know, th that population recovers. And, you know, we, we get this um, you know, harmony with nature. And, you know, we get, you know, humans are predators. It's like, you know, lions and wolves are. I mean, that, that's, that's who we are. And, and I, I think that's a very important thing. This has been great, Kai. I really appreciate it. Um, this has got some wonderful stuff. What is, so you, yeah, you've got a show that's coming out that's secret, super secret. You can't tell us that's the, the, the spread. I will say that I'm going to guess you didn't die. In the <laughs> <laughs> we know you made it out. Kai does not die. Um, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, so, and you're, you look pretty healthy, so maybe nothing untoward happened to you, you know, but, um, 
do you have anything beyond that? There's anything else coming up after that? Do you have a book coming out? Did you write a book? Do you need to write a book? Maybe you should write a book. Uh, I do have a book. (laughs) I have a book. It's called Girls Own Survival Guide. And it's about using a survival attitude to get you through everyday life. Um, It also has some tips for the outdoors, but it was um, was more of an acknowledgement of, you know, like a granny can get lost for three months and survive fine, and an army dude can get lost and die by the end of the day. You know, it's not about, it's not necessarily about the skills or the toys you have when you go into a situation. It's all about a mindset. So, um, you know, I mean, I, uh, I wish I could tell you I had a lot of other stuff, but I've just got these two shows coming out. Um, so Naked Afraid and Alone on February 23rd and then um, First Man Out, I think March, where I race Ed Stafford um, out of a high altitude mountain um, in, in Tibet or the Tibetan plateau in China. Um, and honestly, my, my surgeon said to me that this operation could take up to 16 months to recover from. Um, so I didn't put anything on the cards and now he's revised that and feels like I'll be back in action in less than four. So, um, yeah, so I'm just sort of keeping an open mind with the future and seeing where it leads. Meet for the win. Awesome. Hey, let me, <laughs> let me just, you know, if, if uh, Zach and I get lost in the wilderness for some reason, so I don't know, I mean, just some scenario, what do we need? What, what are some top three survival tips to sort of keep us from getting killed? Uh, be flexible because most people just immediately start to think they need food. You can last 21 days without food. So just be flexible to whatever situation you're in and look at what your priority would be. So if you're in the Amazon, water is obviously not your priority because it's all around you. If you're in the desert, water is going to be your priority. So just um, be flexible with your thinking. So be adaptable to your situation. A lot of people feel like there's these steps that they have to go. If they make a plan, they have to follow it. That's how you die. Um, And also, honestly, it sounds really cheesy, but um, don't focus on the things that you cannot change. Like, and this is what I do in life too. You know, there's certain things that you can't change. So don't whine about it. Just get on with it um, and use your time and energy to make your situation better every moment that you can. So those would be the things. Or you can go for the practical food, fire, water, shelter, and that would be the thing that you're looking at. (laughs) To me, it's all up here. (laughs) Makes sense and applicable to everyday life, as I'm sure your book kind of alludes to. But uh, we will link that stuff into the show notes. People can check out like your social media and find your book and hopefully watch you in about a month. Yeah, thank you. It's lovely chatting with you guys. Awesome, Kai. This has been wonderful. And do you guys say ta? Is that something you guys say in Australia? Ta. Um, ta, we say as like, thank you, instead yeah, of thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, ta. ta. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Make sure I still do that, Tanner. <laughs> Hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.